Greetings. Today I'm going to be talking about the difference between essentialism and descriptivity. Now essentialism is a, a vast, vast topic and I don't want to spend the rest of my life talking about it. That's how vast it is. There is philosophical essentialism, biological essentialism, even Plato's forms, if you will, as a kind of essentialism. And say, for example, in biological essentialism, Prior to Darwin's revelations, there was a widespread belief that animals or animal life is unchanging. Something is what it is. Now, essentialism is largely incorrect as a coherent system of describing things. And I'm actually going to be putting these two different concepts, descriptivity and essentialism on opposite poles, and I'm going to advocate for descriptivity and argue that I, I strive to be a descriptivist as well as why that's a better approach and why claims of essentialism to MGTOW line of thought, at least in my camp, are incorrect. But basically what you have with the essentialist claim, the, the kernel of truth is that there are some things that have essential properties. That matter has the essential properties of having, of being composed of molecules and atoms. A lion has the essentialist property of being a carnivore. Uh, you could also argue that uh, having sharp incisor teeth is an essentialist property of being a carnivore too. I mean, you're not going to find a lion that has large, powerful, grinding molars. It's not a lion anymore. And it couldn't be a carnivore. It would be a very inefficient way of being a carnivore. So, and there, there are things in between. Uh, look at omnivores like bears, which have slightly different dentition. But that's not really, I mean, I don't want to get bogged down into that. What I really want to talk about is how you can still be descriptive without being an essentialist and why essentialist claims are essentially incorrect. Now we can look at different forms of human behavior from an essentialist perspective or a descriptive perspective. I prefer the descriptive perspective. Let's take risk taking and risk aversion. Kind of old hat topic, everyone knows it, but it's very useful for the purpose of demonstrating the point I want to make. Men tend to be more risk friendly and women tend to be more risk averse and I think tend is being pretty generous I think there's a very strong inclination for men to be more risk friendly and vice versa women have a strong inclination to be more risk averse that doesn't mean that all men are risk friendly and all women are risk averse and it doesn't mean the male is, by inserting a definite article, creating an abstract, or the, the female is so-and-so. But in being descriptive, what are we talking about? Why is it the case, for example, that men tend to be, are strongly inclined to be more risk-friendly than risk-averse, and women not so? Well, it all goes back to, and pardon me, my throat is a bit hoarse today, it all goes back to the idea of limited factor in reproduction versus not limited factor in reproduction. You have to think of an evolutionary context in where taking risk, if you already have something very valuable, a uterus and the ability to bear children, that is filled up with time constraints, that is pregnancy being burdened down, whereas men don't have those constraints, why, why a risk would be a useful exercise of time for a prehistoric female or for an early human female. And why risk could potentially be a good use of time, good exercise of time for a male. Well, in the case of a male, risk is risk. He can still die. And in the process, he loses his ability to pass on his genes. However, if he's successful, then he will be recognized. He achieves greater status and so on and so forth. Now, this isn't to say that there were not women and have not been women are not women and men who defy these principles, defy this, these general tendencies, indeed these strong tendencies. 
it's almost certain that there were men in the past, as they are, as they exist today as well, that are not risk friendly. And those men do not have a genetic lineage uh, because they could not reproduce. A man who is protecting himself rather than taking risks for the benefit of females or for the benefit of female approval or for the benefit of intrasexual uh, competition, status, dominance, hierarchy, is not going to be genetically successful. Likewise, the opposite is true for a woman. There almost certainly were women, and there are women today, not many, for good reason, which I'm about to explain, uh, who were much more risk-friendly than what would be typically expected of a woman. And those women, once again, just like the men, probably don't have genetic lineages for two reasons. One, they either died in the, in the attempt of being risky and engaging in risky behavior like men and trying to garner some reward, and even if they were successful, risk and accomplishment are not things that men find particularly attractive and interesting to mate as a primary absolute. The desire to take risk and the ability to engage in successful risky behavior is a signifier of an attractive mate to a female because that means this male can provide resources and can, if need be, protect the female. That's not a requirement for men. So women who engaged in risky behavior were not genetically successful, and their lineages probably died off as well. Well, almost certainly their lineages died off. Now, men who don't engage in risky behavior, such as myself, are genetic failures as well. My, my lineage will die off with me. And women who do not en who engage in very risky behavior... Well, I guess in the modern world, it's a bit more complicated. But certainly in the past, they didn't have a genetic lineage to speak of. <clears throat> Pardon me. The difference between essentialism here and descriptivity is we're describing why men are more risk-friendly and women are more risk-averse. Uh, these are not essential qualities of either a man or a woman, but... I would argue they're near essential qualities if you want to be reproductively successful, respectively, for the principles and parameters of being a man and for those that guide women's behavior and are required for women. This does not mean, of course, that, once again, each and every woman and each and every man conforms to a certain behavior. But in being descriptive about the world, and we look at various animals, and we look at human beings, there are overwhelming tendencies that can be observed and documented and noted down. Take, for example, my recent video on assortative mating, where I look at a small subsector of the male population, by no means all of them, and try to explain why men in nationalist movements, ethnic movements, nationalist ethnic movements, etc., are overwhelmingly better represented than women. Of course, there are women who participate in those things, but if you look at the numbers I, I offered there, it's somewhere between 80 and 86% majority male. And that tells you something. It doesn't mean that all men do that. But if we want to understand what the motivations behind those behaviors are, then we need to come up with ideas. Now, I'm not claiming I'm right. Maybe my hypothesis is completely off base, although I think I do strong evidence to suggest that uh, it's very likely that at the very least reproductive patterns of behavior uh, reinforce a greater male tendency to form coalitions and, and groups of this sort. And perhaps the, pat the paternal assurance aspect is a little bit more doubtful. Maybe we need more data. But... That is what the descriptive process is. It's trying to describe what we see. That's very different from saying the white nationalist is by definition male. That does, first off, that doesn't tell you anything about his motivations, and it also excludes the women who happen to be there too. Now, generally speaking, the converse of that, of course, is that 
most women don't tend towards those movements. Of course, there are going to be some. And why? Because, once again, it's not reproductively beneficial or effective to be part of that. Reproductive opportunism, as I talked about in the video, is an effective reproductive strategy. Keeping your options open is an effective reproductive strategy if, you know, your village is going to be raided and everyone, all the men are going to be killed and children are going to be killed and you're going to be kidnapped. Not, it's not an effective strategy for men, of course. Now, having this information allows us to make certain decisions about our lives, specifically with reference to MGTOW. Once again, there have been a, there's been a slew of some attacks by various individuals uh, on, against MGTOW, but I, mean, I don't look at MGTOW as a, a sort of collective ideology. These people do. This guy named Armored Skeptic and this guy named Dave at Computing and Forever. Unfortunately, uh, MGTOW, to my view, is not an, an ideology. It's just yeah, going my own way, doing what I want, doing my own thing. Now, obviously, there's some people that frame it that way, but I think we shouldn't be too concerned with these individuals. The real question is, can we draw conclusions, non-essentialist conclusions, from descriptive models about behavior? And can those conclusions have an influence on our lives in the decisions we make about how we want to live our lives? So I would argue yes. If we observe the gamut and the run of human behaviors, and we see how human interaction works and how reproductive interaction works, you can make a decision as a male and say, look, that's just not worth it for me. Life is short. I don't care about my genetic lineage. Uh, I don't want to be stressed out all the time. I'm going to make a decision after, at least in my case, having tried it out to not engage in the reproductive game, to opt out. Because, frankly speaking, life is too short. Yeah. Does that, is that an essentialist view of women? I don't think so. If we have a statistical tendency in a population that is very great, then I think you can justify non-participation. Let's think of an imaginary situation, scenario, community. Let's say there was this island called Wonka Dunk in, uh, next to Australia. That sounds like a very Australian thing, name. So the, the island of Wonkadonk, and on this island of Wonkadonk, there were uh, cannibals, and there were uh, people who engaged in very strange rituals, like uh, they believe in burning off the tips of your toes and all sorts of things, uh, kinds of behaviors that we generally don't consider conducive towards uh, well-being. And then they, scientists, researchers, actually do research and find out that maybe 86% of Wonkadonkians engage in this sort of behavior and they're people who don't and what have you, would it be a, a wise decision to travel to Wonkadonk and engage with Wonkadonkians and all of this? I mean, now of course we don't have specific, it's impossible to come up with specific percentages and I argue no, it's not a wise idea to go to Wonkadonk or to engage with Wonkadonkians. I'm sure the 14% of, of Wonkadonkians are, are just fine, but uh, you know, there are risks, inherent risks involved there. Now, I have been criticized by people privately and publicly that uh, personally for me, I'm not going to lie, and I think men, many men are dishonest uh, about this, but the primary reason why men interact with women is, one, for sexual gratification, and two, for, you know, that, that very poorly defined male mother knee, that feeling of being comforted and all that other shit, okay? Now, sexual gratification can be had through porn and a, me a million other things. As far as male mother need, pff, I think when you understand descriptive models of human behavior well enough, uh, you, you can't completely eliminate it, but you can certainly vitiate it. To the extent that it, it's if you don't think it's something that's actually fulfillable, and it is a fantasy, mind you, because 
obviously the idea of men seeking comfort in women's arms and, and women respecting that about them is not a good idea. I mean, that's always a covert. The desire for male mother need is always a covert operation. That is to say, a man trying to sort of sneak that need in and, and somehow the woman not noticing it. I guess sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But the idea that one must engage in these kinds of things. I mean, if you look at the, the attacks on low-hanging fruit in the MGTOW community, or you look at some of the people attacking, the implication is that one must engage in relationships. And to the extent that one uh, does not, it's, it's only a consequence of a certain set of circumstances, such as the legal system, the courts, and so on and so forth. What about if you just want to have less stress in your life? What about if you just want to do your own thing? Uh, what about if you just don't care anymore? And uh, people find that difficult to fathom. But it's not, you can draw conclusions from descriptive models without being an essentialist. And like I said, there are plenty of men who aren't, uh, not many, by way of comparison to the men who are risk-friendly. And there are plenty of women who are, not many once again, who are probably uh, not so risk-averse. Uh, this is something that you can understand without being an essentialist. But the idea that you can draw no conclusions from anything. I mean, effectively what these people who are critical of uh, these things are, that they're, they claim that MGTOW is very much similar to a feminist narrative. But, and maybe for some MGTOW that's true, but the fact of the matter is none of these people are interested in descriptive models of human behavior. They're not trying to understand the bigger picture. Um, they just want the system, quote-unquote, system to be fixed. That doesn't really tell us very much about anything. I mean, how could the system be fixed? By a reinstating patriarchal tradition? And what woman in her right mind is going to allow for that? I mean, you don't need to be a feminist to be opposed to that. Now, if sh shit hits the fan in some post-apocalyptic scenario, of course, that's what's going to happen. A default to some sort of paternalistic patriarchal system. And maybe a lot of men would like that. But uh, the idea that the system can be fixed, I th I'm deeply skeptical of. And I do think that uh, ultimately the best we can do is form hypotheses and come up with descriptive models of how men and women interact. And from that, from based on these, we can decide whether or not we want to engage in the reproductive game. Now, in a similar fashion to risk, take something such as hypergamy. A woman in the past who was not hypergamous, and I'm sure there were a few, was probably not reproductively very successful because she would have settled for lower quality genes. So in as much as she did reproduce, the gene quality would have been, the genetic material would have been worse. But the resources probably wouldn't have been there so over time, natural selection, evolution selected for a kind of model of behavior in women that is hypergamous, looking to for the better deal. That's not the case with men because men don't need women's resources, pretty obvious. Now, this can become complicated if you decide on your own personal basis to turn off your rationality. I, I've seen in a recent video calls for rationality, but is it rational to not take into account na behaviors that were selected for by evolution and decisions you make in your life? I don't think so. And furthermore, I, I've heard, I've been in private conversations with people, I've uh, in, been challenged this idea of, of by default, the vast majority of women are hypergamous for really silly reasons. I said, look, this person, and this was a conversation with a random person, your sister in this case, uh, would she have married a street sweeper rather than a successful uh, entrepreneur? The retort to this was not, no, she would not have because of X, Y, Z. The retort to this was... Uh, a two quoque, effectively, 
Um, well, would you marry a street sweeper? Well, number one, I wouldn't marry, but would I date a street sweeper or a janitor or something like that? Yeah, men don't care about that. I think uh, Colton's classic example in his Aussie uh, cowboy accent was the the rich guy, uh, the rich dude uh, dating the waffle waitress. You don't find the same thing. So a lot of these people who claim to be rational are not taking into account the science behind uh, some of this behavior. And frankly speaking, uh, if people want to attack low-hanging fruit and, I mean, for clickbait or whatever, they can do that. But I would welcome a debate on the actual topics between people. I take someone like Armored Skeptic, who clearly has no interest in actual skepticism or anything like that. In fact, he claims he's in, a get in that video, which I, I looked. The other critique video was the uh, one by uh, David Computing Forever. He calls himself an egalitarian. What basis in reality does egalitarianism have? What Equality before the law, that's not even achievable. But you know, let's just say that in theory is achievable. He doesn't define his position on egalitarianism. He just calls himself an egalitarian. These people who are, uh, quote unquote, critical of MGTOW find it very easy to attack the low-hanging fruit of, of, frankly speaking, MGTOW ideas. I would welcome open debate with any of these people on topics related to human reproductive behavior, male and female motivations, and so on and so forth. Um, but I don't think that would be forthcoming because, frankly speaking, I think these people are just engaged in kind of a clickbait campaign or whatever. It's, it's easy to attack low-hanging fruit. It's, it's, I mean, how often has Anita Sarkeesian been debunked? I mean, <laughs> look at a guy like Thunderfoot, who's a bloody nuclear scientist who puts out video after video of repeated Anita Sarkeesian material and gets paid $3,000 for it. I don't blame him for that. I would do the same thing, probably. But let's be honest, that, that's, not, that's not rigorous. I mean, he's a scientist, for, for Zeus's sake. That's not rigorous intellectual behavior. I'm not claiming I'm always rigorously intellectual. I don't think this video is particularly rigorously intellectual. But the point I'm making is pretty simple, that yeah, if people were actually interested in debating some of these ideas, they would do so. They would say, hmm, Armored Skeptic would say, hmm, uh, if he even mentioned, mentioned hypergamy, which I don't think he did, if women uh, are hypergamous, to, to what degree and what motivates it and and if he doesn't believe that, then he could come up with counter-arguments. Well, I don't believe women are hypergamous because of X sort of circumstances uh, in a evolutionary set, setting of natural selection or what have you. I mean, these ideas can, can be challenged. Instead, they're just dismissed as ludicrous. Now, this is a common technique in basically diffusing debate. Now, Take the example of uh, hate, hate speech laws and in particular Holocaust denial. Now, my personal view on the Holocaust is that it was a, a historical event. I think the numbers might be off by a bit, but I think it happened. Uh, I think there, were, there was, a, it was a systematic uh, attempt to eliminate not only Jew, uh, Jewish people. This is unfortunate that this is a separate issue. I don't want to get on, but the, the, the nar narrative is unfortunately d dominated by the... The, the Jewish narrative, but three million Poles, uh, political dissidents, I mean, a total of 11 million people, give or take. I mean, who knows what the exact numbers were? Was there an attempt? I think the evidence suggests there was. However, if you don't believe that, uh, and you say that, let's say you say no one was killed, or only 100,000 people were killed, or whatever, you are ostracized, you were just shut down and made fun of. No, 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 and the way you do this is you create hate speech laws. If people don't believe that, then they should be challenged and debunked. And I think there is good evidence to suggest that, yeah, like I said, there was a systematic attempt to kill lots of people, homosexuals, Poles, all kinds of people, certain priests. Uh, and if you don't believe that, that's fine. And I, I'm, I'm actually for discussion and debate. In the same, but look, but this is how... A shutting down of discussion occurs, basically. When you have people who just say, oh, that's just stupid, or do a two quoque on you, 
oh, you wouldn't you wouldn't date a, a janitor or a street sweeper either. Now, that's not a debate. That's not a discussion. If you're interested in ideas, you should always be willing to discuss them and, and amenable to uh, to new evidence and and open to changing those ideas if need be. <clears throat> Maybe my paternal assurance hypothesis is completely off base. I don't think so. I think sort of the tip of the iceberg with that. But I do think men, the evidence suggests that men are much more in tune with the physical, uh, looking for cues, because it's, it's an algorithm basically for determining uh, paternal certainty and therefore justifying male paternal investment in his children as opposed to someone else's. I mean, it just it makes sense. Uh, and if people disagree with that, they can find up, come up with arguments that, that counter that. And if the evidence is overwhelming, I will shift my position. But like I said, none of these people who are particularly critical of MGTOW are critical of any of those sorts of ideas or anything like that. They don't care about them. They're really operating on a visceral notion, much like the feminists, in fact. They're saying, well, uh, I can't believe they said that about women. We need to defend the women by calling them just dumb and stupid. They're, they're not actually listening to the arguments. And the guy who was criticized, I don't listen to him. I don't really know very much about him, the mayor of MGTOW. Uh, I didn't even really listen to what he said in the video. I doubt he was making arguments, so I guess there's nothing to counter. But notice the repeated tendency of these people to attack low-hanging fruit as opposed to at least efforts on the attempts of others, such as myself or Coltane, to come up with ideas and hypotheses and what have you. Uh, this is a repeated pattern, but it doesn't surprise me. Anyway, I've rambled on enough. I just wanted to address this issue of essentialism and descriptivity and uh, this, the latest uh, attack on the low-hanging fruit of the world. Until the next time, enjoy your weekend, and uh, hopefully with a bit of luck and God's willing, I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.